Good afternoon, everyone. Um, welcome to Walker Hancock from Soldiers Memorial Sculptor to Monuments Man. Uh, my name is Jamie Bassant. I'm the Visitor Engagement Coordinator at Soldiers Memorial Military Museum. Um, before we get into the program today, there's a few housekeeping things I need to get out of the way. Uh, first of all, I want to thank uh, the sponsor of this is part of the Chow and Chat series and Beelman Truck Company uh, sponsors the Chow and Chat series. So thanks to Beelman Truck Company for helping us put these on. And thanks also to all of our members for supporting us and letting us do programs like this. Um, uh, I need to remind everyone that the uh, Soldiers Memorial Military Museum and Missouri History Museum are both open with uh, some COVID safety practices in place. Uh, we're open Wednesday through Sunday, 10 a.m. to 5 p.m. Uh, and we are still at a reduced capacity, so we encourage people to sign up for advanced registration at our website, which is mohistory.org. Um, let's see, as for the webinar, uh, this is a webinar, so participants, uh, you know, don't have active cameras, don't have active mics, uh, but we are taking questions. So if you have a question, please use the Q&A box on your little Zoom tool toolbar there, and that's going to be the best way for us to find your question at the end of the program. Hopefully we'll have time to answer everybody's questions, but if we can't get to every single one, apologies in advance. Um, and there's also automated closed captioning available on Zoom now, so if that would be useful for you, you can find that in the, uh, in the toolbar as well. So I think that's everything I needed to cover. Uh, let me introduce today's speaker. Uh, her name is Melissa Wolf. She's the uh, Curator of American Art at the St. Louis Art Museum. And she's gonna be telling us about St. Louis sculptor Walker Hancock, his work with the Monuments Men and uh, some of his later work in sculpture. So thank you, Melissa. Sure. Can, is it, do I sound okay? Can you hear me? Yes, perfect. Okay. Great. Well, first of all, thank you so much for um, inviting me to give this talk. It's been really fun to dig in a little bit to a sculptor who I've been interested in, but um, you know, there's there's only so much time in a life. So this has been really fun to do the extra research. So um, if we can move our slide, Jamie. There we go. So there's Mr. Hancock. He was born um, in 1901 in St. Louis. Uh, his father was a lawyer and uh, his art had always been his interest. So his earliest memory that he writes about is sitting on his father's shoulders and um, looking at the incandescent lights as they reflect on the lagoon during the St. Louis World's Fair in 1904. So a very visual memory. Um, after that, he uh, loves uh, the St. Louis Art Museum and slide which you can see why. This is an image of the um, sculpture hall, which is much uh, less busy now. Uh, this is after 1910. So it would have been um, when Hancock was growing up and in high school. And then it looked pretty much like this until into the 1914s and 20s. So uh, it was filled with sculpture. I mean, what a better experience for someone who wants to become a sculptor than this. And he talks about seeing these various ones and being really um, inspired by them. So at 14, he began attending um, the evening school, Wednesday evening schools and the day school at Washington University in, in sculpture and in studio art. Um, when he's 15, he, he, he's, he's recognized very early on for sculpture and it seems that like he was born wanting to be one, which isn't always the case. So when he was 14, uh, or when he was 15, he, um, the St. Louis Art, uh, the Art League, created a national competition to create an art medal that they were giving away as a competition. And he entered, um, it was a blind, it was a blind uh, judging and he won second prize. And, you know, his father was a little unsure about going into art, but with that, he thought, well, if he can do this at 15, he's gonna be okay. So then he became a really staunch supporter of him. Um, all St. Louis are gonna ask me this question, but he graduated in 1919 from Central High School. <laughs> um, and then he spent one year at Washington University. Can I have a slide, Jamie? And here you actually see him at Washington University um, as a student. And if you look at that second column back, uh, he, he's in profile, he's in a dark suit <clears throat> and he's a student at one of their sculpture classes. So he spends his first year of college at Washington University and then he transfers to the Pennsylvania Academy of the Fine Arts, which is in Philadelphia. And he does so because Charles Grafley teaches there and he's really known as the premier sculpture teacher um, in the country at the time. He becomes the top student at PAFA, which is what we 
called Pennsylvania Academy of the Fine Arts. He won all their prizes. He won two different traveling scholarships to go through Europe. So he knew Europe well by the time he graduated. After graduation, he applied for um, what's called the Prix de Rome. And it is the sort of, um, it's an international competition. It's like the top competition for people wanting to study sculpture at the American Academy in Rome and he gets it. So he spends three years in Rome, traveling around Europe, working on sculpture. Um, when he returns, um, <clears throat> Grafley is very ill and, and old, and he asks that, um, that Hancock be, replace him as the head of the sculpture department, and so he does. So Hancock works there from 1929 until his retirement in 1967. So his whole career, basically, except for his time in the military service, and he goes again for a, um, another residency at the American Academy in Rome. Um, so his first major commission and uh, slide is um, at the zoo and you can still see it. It's called the Zuni Bird Charmer. And when he saw the drinking fountain, it was a commission. When he saw the drinking fountain, it's, it's in an art deco style, but it's actually what's called um, deco Pueblo or Pueblo deco because it comes out of the Southwest and it's these simplified um, uh, styles from Pueblo, uh, from Pueblo uh, Native Americans. And so he decides on a Pueblo theme with the, with the bird um, charmer. Uh, it was in the aviary. Um, now it is at the east entrance of the birdhouse. Um, it won uh, PAFA's 1932 fellowship prizes, which is one of their major prizes. So he makes a statement about himself as a sculptor, and I want to kind of stick to this as we go through, because I think it tells us really a lot about him. And he's talking about commissions, and he says that his interest in, in sculpture, in commissions, is, quote, to try to reach a fitting solution. In other words, is this the right thing for this place? It's always been fascinating to me to try to find the right solution to the problem and then to try to bring one's clients into agreement to accept the right thing. And then sometimes the problem of getting the thing executed properly. So sort of this three-step process that requires, and I think it shows him as someone who has a mind that's strategic, very diplomatic, and also very sensitive to how the work is going to be viewed and the expression that it's going to give. <clears throat> Our next slide. So his most important pre-war work, pre-World War II work, is the commission for the sculptures at the two entrances to the Soldiers Memorial. It was for four sculptures, um, and we are all probably familiar with these, right? Um, the idea for Soldiers Memorial was to honor the World War I dead, it was first proposed in 1919. Um, and this is partially because of patriotism, but also there were so many memorials from World War I because so many men, um, uh, soldiers had lost their lives in Europe and were buried there. And it was very difficult for families or relatives to be able to, to get there to see their, see, the, um, see their burials. So memorials were built around the country in order to take place for that. Uh, the building of it was passed by a bond issue in 1923, which also funded the municipal auditorium, which now what's left is Stifle Theater and the Civil Courts building. Um, however, no construction began, remember we're going into the uh, Great Depression, until they get funding from the WPA, one of part of Roosevelt's New Deal. So construction begins in 1935. It's dedicated by uh, President Roosevelt in 1936, and it opens to the public in 1938. As you can see in the slides, it is a, it's an art deco building, right? The clean square lines, um, the simplified forms. Um, it's a neoclassical building, right? It sort of has the language from Greek and Roman temples. Um, and, and, uh, um, uh, uh, Hancock describes it, I think, in a really interesting way. He says, quote, that it's art deco, but a very ponderous architectural mass. Very good, I think, for its kind. And so he's building on that when he's making these sculptures and thinking about this. Um, so uh, Hancock was in the East at his studio, and he was visited by the architecture or the architect for the commission. And they asked if he would be interested in the commission. Um, what they wanted was winged horses. <laughs> that was one of the things that they asked for. And Hancock could only think of Pegasus, which doesn't really have anything to do with memorials. And so what he says is, well, why don't we pair the horses with figures that then we can make symbolized memorial? So again, this sort of negotiating and thinking, right? So um, before we look at the sculptures 
particularly exactly. I want to walk through the process of sculpture because it may not be as well known. So if we want to go to the next slide. The beginning step would be a sketch, but it's a three dimensional sketch. They are usually made in plastiline, which is um, a very malleable, moldable clay. It doesn't dry quickly. You can change it and, you know, move an arm, move a head, you know, as maybe um, the, the, you know, the client for the commission wants things differently. Um, so that's very mobile and, and, and that would be shown to get the commission. So he showed these very simple, um, you know, impressions almost of what it is. And here you see loyalty and sacrifice. And I want you to notice quickly that sacrifice is holding something on the right, sort of, you can't quite tell what it is. Maybe it's a flower or bouquet or something, but it's not really clear. Um, <clears throat> excuse me, these would go then on to half scale working models. And can we have a slide, Jamie? Um, these are presented to the architect and the public, the director of public works. So as I said, they were approved. And I'm just showing you all three to sort of give you the sense of this process. So the work in the middle is the is one of the models, a clay model that's at the St. Louis Art Museum and is up in our galleries. Um, it's not a half scale model. The figures themselves are 15 feet. So a half scale model is again, maybe one step bigger than this. But I want you to see the process. So very impressionistic model, you get the idea, sort of proof of concept. Then the middle one where you've worked out some of the details, <clears throat> you get the go ahead to make the larger one. And here you see then the larger one, the process of courage. And I wanna go ahead just for a minute, one slide, Jamie, because you might ask, well, how do you get from a small sculpture to a very big one? Because Hancock doesn't carve these all by himself. He sends them off to carvers who are very, um, very trained and very uh, talented at transferring Hancock's carving, just the basic shape into a large, into a large, um, a large limestone is what the sculptures are made out of. And if you're doing one-to-one, -one, you might use a pointing machine, which is what you see on the left, which um, on the other side of that, well, you, you know, measure the sculpture, right? And then you take it over to your block or your clay and you match those points, right, to recreate it. Or there's a pentagraph and that's what you see or pantograph on the right. And that would take, you set up a ratio and you put pins on the original and then you put pins on the bigger and then you match them up the same way. So you can go larger or smaller with that. So, um, so he gets them all done. Can we go back maybe to vision and yeah, there, oh, go forward. I'm sorry, yeah, forward, I said back, there we go. So here we see vision and courage in the final forms. There's a wonderful solidity of mass that I think responds to the solidity of the, of the, of the architecture, right? This great weight simple lines, you can read these really easily, no matter what the light is, right, because they're outside. Um, very clear movements, you know, they're, they're a beautiful muscular form, you know, you feel the movement of the horse, but it's done in very simple language. Um, so it's very clearly read, beautiful lines. I love the big grand sort of aria lines in these pieces. Um, and then on the north side, one slide, Jamie, is loyalty and sacrifice. And you can see from the front on the left that, that the, that the um, what the figure is symbolizing is on the front to help you read that. Um, but of course, behind the scenes, there's a story. So there is a problem, as I told you, like Hancock thinks about problems. So the architect calls Hancock, it is a huge mess in St. Louis. Um, they're gonna have to change the design from the, so when I told you to notice that wreath, right? Here you see sacrifice and now she's holding a baby. So the architect called, he's trying to get the director, um, director of public works to change it to a baby, but the carvers are saying it's gonna cost him a thousand dollars more to change this, whatever it was, bouquet of flowers or whatever, to a baby. So Hancock thinks that crazy. So he comes out to St. Louis, um, he talks to the director of public works and the director of public works kept saying, I'm not going to do the baby. There's no baby. I don't want a baby. And he says, okay, I won't make you have a baby and I'll pay you the thousand dollars to tell me what you want and we'll change it. Well, the director wouldn't agree with that because then you'd have to change all the contracts and, and protocols and he doesn't want to do that bureaucracy. So then he goes to Hancock goes to talk to the carvers because he knows they're not saying something that's exactly true. So the carvers were the Moseri company. They were, they made tombstones basically. They were the lowest bidder. So they got it. 
Um, and so he's talking to him and he says, you know, the baby shouldn't cost any more than intricate flowers to carve. It's actually easier to carve. And so what he realizes is that the carvers were just in over their heads in both costs, in the technical expertise, and they needed more money to bring in better carvers. So um, that's what they're pushing for. So, you know, to Hancock's credit, he doesn't back away. And he says, now, wait a minute. I had to already change my design for you because you messed up on one of the wings. And I don't know which sculpture this is. And he said, so I had to change the design so that you could make it up and not tell anyone. And he said, so if you don't make a baby, I may not keep that a secret. <laughs> and so the baby gets made. He does say later on, it seems like they got paid a little bit more. So this is his, his most important pre-war um, pre sculpture. He, of course, World War, II, World War II is going on and he gets drafted into the army in October of 1942. Um, and can we have a slide, Jamie? There he is. Um, you see him the second from the left there. Um, so he goes into the Metal Corps originally and then he's transferred to Washington DC because he had won a competition to do an air medal for the for the services. And so they transfer him to go to Washington DC to finish that. Um, and then he go, moves into the military intelligence. Um, he becomes the first Lieutenant and he does so because of his knowledge of European culture. Um, he's fluent in French and Italian, his ability to organize, you know, clearly he's ran things. He's promoted to captain in 1943. And that's when he's transferred to the US Army Monuments, Fine Arts and Archives. Um, which MFAA is how it's abbreviated. We all know them now as the Monuments Men. It is a British American run organization. He's shipped off to England with all the other um, Monuments Men. And while he's in England, he's there about seven months or more, he writes the French handbook for US soldiers. So what the, um, what he's doing is when soldiers go into areas, he's writing a manual that says, what are the buildings that should be preserved? What are the things that should be off limits for you know, billeting soldiers, you know, what kind of objects are, are precious and maybe should be, you know, taken away from, from, the, uh, from the area. He also drafts a directive um, for General Eisenhower prior to the D-Day invasion, giving all officers the authority to protect all this art and architecture. Um, he's one of 10 Monuments men who were at first sent out. So it wasn't a big group yet. That's a, that comes a little later. And he was sent to um, follow the D-Day invasion to implement all of these things. So the bigger question is what did the monuments do? Well, they compiled lists of protected monuments and directives related to them. Um, do you wanna go back one, Jamie? <clears throat> Thanks. <clears throat> They traveled around from center points, right, to identify architecture of importance and archives and movable art that could they could move to avoid if combat is coming into that area. They located depositories of works of art. So people in Europe, the Europeans, Belgians, Germans, French, you know, knew when there was battles coming that they would take out all of the um, objects out of the buildings, everything that was important. and and bury them or hide them somewhere. And so um, he was looking for local depositories of work so that he could arrange for their safekeeping. Um, and also to provide emergency treatment. If there was deterioration or damage, then, um, then the monuments men could help, um, you know, help, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, help fix it in sort of, you know, in the field kind of thing. Um, and then also the evacuation of these deposits, these depository arms back to collection, US collection sites where they could be held, indexed, and then sent back to where they had been taken. So his very first battle experience is the Battle of Aachen. And now, Jamie, if you wanna change that slide. <clears throat> and to get a sense of, of Hancock and his, his sensitivity, I wanna read just very quickly to you his description. He, he writes an article in the Journal of, of um, American Art or the College Art Journal, excuse me. And it's called Experiences of a Monument Officer in Germany. And he, and he publishes it in 1946. And he describes coming into Aachen. And I just think it's so um, sensitive. You know, you get a sense of what he's looking at and the effect that this has on him. So he says, for two weeks, we had watched Aachen burning below the horizon, an unsteady glow in the sky at night. By day, a constant column of smoke. Now it was time to go in. After pausing those rows of green concrete dragon's teeth that had not stopped the American tanks, our road followed a trolley track, still in good condition for the first few miles. Then the wires began to hang in festoons. Farther on, all the wires were down. 
In some places, the tracks had reared on themselves from their ties to assume attitudes of weird contortions. Occasionally, an abandoned tram car or suggested a scene of surprise and passengers running for cover. Fashionable houses that we passed had fewer and fewer windows as we descended the long slope leading down into the ancient capital of Charlemagne's empire. Soon roofs and walls were missing. That's supposed to be off. Soon roofs and walls um, were missing and piles of debris appeared in front of each house. Now the walls were no longer enclosed floors and partitions all were gutted. What they had contained had been spilled into lawns or into streets and heaps reeking with filth and promise for the souvenir hunter. On a lean horse, a GI galloped by, bedecked with the complete feathered regalia of an Indian chief. Most of those bent on fancy dress had, however, contented themselves with opera hats and alpenstocks. Desolation increased as we approached the commercial district. Many walls were standing and some streets showed only occasional gaps in their facades, but behind these roofless brick fronts was only emptiness. The city was utterly abandoned. I realized at once what I later so often found to be true, that a skeleton city is more terrible than one that the bombs have completely flattened. Aachen was a skeleton. Here and there, stenciled upon charred walls, we saw for the first time the figure that was to become so familiar to us in Germany, the black silhouette of a sinister little man leaning to eavesdrop with the warning, the enemy is listening. I left the war correspondents who had brought me with him and I walked alone towards the cathedral. Picking my way over heaps of evil smelling rubble that blocked the narrow streets, I left behind me all visible life. Only once did I encounter any other living creatures, a band of Belgian marauders in uniform who eyed me apprehensively as they passed. The day was dark. Occasionally the tearing whistle of a shell followed by an echoing explosion emphasized the awful stillness. Once I stood motionless to listen after a shell had burst and could discern not a sound of any kind whatsoever. The curious dome and spire of the cathedral were visible over the ruins of the Altstadt. The steel frame of the Rathaus tower drooped limply into the square. As I picked my way into the narrow street that led to the towering 14th century choir of the cathedral, shells began uh, to fall uncomfortably near. I ducked under insecure doorways as each rending sound approached and ran to the next bit of cover as soon as the shell had exploded. All the doors were standing open in that strange cluster of churches that is the Cathedral of Aachen. Once inside the dark octagon, octagon that forms its nucleus, I felt suddenly secure. For more than 11 centuries, these massive walls had stood intact. That I should have arrived just in time to be the sole witness of their destruction was reassuringly inconceivable. And so you see this experience and how sensitive he is. And Jamie, do you want to change the next slide? And so here's you see, you see what he saw going into this choir, which is the end of the cathedral with the with the stained glass. <clears throat> and I have to tell you that Hancock, I think, was particularly moved by this because Jamie, another slide. If you see what it looked like, the cathedral itself, and these stained glass windows are the tallest. They are, um, you know, the medieval, um, late Gothic um, rayonette style. They're the tallest um, um, in, in pretty much the tallest in Europe, and they were destroyed. In fact, they they were destroyed. Many cathedrals, like Cologne, had taken their stained glass windows out and and stored them and saved them. And Aachen was not able to do that. Um, they've been rebuilt or remade. Um, in a modern style. Uh, but so here's what you see. And actually one more slide, Jamie, and I think you'll see the outside of it. So you see these just in incredibly tall um, stained glass windows. So to walk into it when it looks like this, when he knows what it looks like is so, um, so powerful. <clears throat> So as he's going through the area, of course, he's searching for museums and professional staff for lists where he might be able to find things. And he does eventually in the Sermont Museum, they have their collection list and there's um, their collection catalog and there's some marked with red and some have been marked with blue. And uh, the red uh, has notes that says it was removed from Meissen to Seekin. Um, and what Hancock realizes in the other monuments men is that only really, really precious objects would have been moved back to Eastern Germany uh, or back from Eastern Germany to the West at such an incredibly desperate time when transport for troops, for supplies, for displaced people were being stretched you know, to the limits to have given transport to move something, um, objects was pretty remarkable. So he knew Siegen had a depository but it was way behind German lines at the time. 
So just another quick story I wanna tell you about is La Gliz. And that, Jamie, you wanna give me the slide? Which is in Belgium. It was in the middle of the Battle of the Bulge. So um, one of White Hancock's forays into the area, he passes through the town before the battle and he sees a lovely church. It's 11th, 11th century, but it's been added onto. And inside of it is a sort of roughly sculpted wood Madonna, but it is really quite beautiful from the late 13th century. So two weeks after he's gone through, the Battle of the Bulge begins. It starts on December 16th in 1944. The Germans pushing the allies back west. Um, and then it ends in January the 25th, but basically um, between the 18th of December and the 29th Hancock and the rest of the Monuments Men are constantly moving daily further and further, um, further and further north and, and west um, from the fighting lines. They're really only about five miles to six miles in front of them until at the very end, and then they come back. So for two weeks, he had been watching the the map, the battle map. For two weeks, it had run through Legles, the battle front line. Um, so he returns. You want to give me the slide? So he goes back to Legles, and you know it's in the middle of a snow. He returns. He climbs through the church, through the bombed one of the bombed walls. There's not a soul in the village. The roof is about to come down, and what does he see? But the next slide, Jamie, is the Madonna, and there she is. She's unharmed, but the the ceiling is literally falling. So he gathers up maybe a dozen people in the village. They don't wanna let him take the sculpture because they don't trust him. He understands that. So they all finally vote and they agree to take it out. And here you see him helping the villagers. He's on the front left side with the helmet um, and they put it in sort of a local cellar and they keep it. And interestingly, many years later, the vicar at the Aachen Cathedral invites him back um, as an honorary trip. And he goes to visit Legles and sees it being restored. And he talks about how moving that was. So back to Segan, let's go back through another slide. So here he is with some soldiers, Lamont Moore, who becomes a curator or was a curator at the National Gallery of Art, George Stout, who is one of the most um, respected conservators, you know, people who preserve or, uh, or um, uh, fix damaged works of art. So he's one of the leading um, conservators at the time. I think he was at the Brooklyn Museum of Art. So they join, um, they join uh, Hancock as well. So remember, he knew there was likely a major repository of objects at Siegen. It, uh, at Siegen. it was behind German lines. But in March of 45, he learns the American troops are preparing to attack the German forces and take the town. So it had been bombed for three months. Then the troops came through April um, 1st through the 3rd. He and Stout and um, uh, uh, Lamont Moore come in a day later, literally. Um, and they're, you know, walking through the town. Um, there's debris. You want to change the next slide? Thank you. And so they get to the mine. So what they find out is that the repository for all of these objects, and they don't know what all they are, was in an old copper mine. And this is the entrance to it. It's now closed. This is a contemporary entrance to it. Um, so they walk into the mine entrance. Um, it's packed with dispossessed people, with DPs. I mean, almost for you know, an eighth of a mile or something. And he said, it's, it's hot and there's no ventilation. Um, the ground is all slick. There's sulfurous, sulfurous fumes. So it's unhealthy. They keep walking past all these people. They go down a quarter of a mile and they come to a locked door. Someone answers it. They let them in. They go down another passageway to a mechanically secured door and they walk into a room. I don't have a picture of it. I apologize, but it is 200 feet by 33 feet by 23 feet high. It's walled and vaulted with brick and concrete and in it are wooden racks filled with paintings, sculptures, crates. Um, they figure out that there's a, a little over 500 paintings by Cezanne, Cranach, Delacroix, Fragonard, Gauguin, Halls, Rembrandt, Renoir, and uh, Rubens, whose hometown was, was um, Siegen, Van Dyck, Van Gogh. So this you know, incredible um, find. Uh, and also in there are the treasuries from the Aachen and Metz Cathedral. So take another slide, Jamie. So, um, and here you see some of the paintings. So the Watteau's Embarkation for Kithera was one of the works that was there. Van Gogh's portrait of Armand Roulan was there. The next slide. And these, uh, the treasury. So what you have is a repository in the shape of Charlemagne's bust that holds his skull. You have the Karl Shrine, which is 
usually in the, well, is it the altar of the Aachen Cathedral, which holds the bones of Charlemagne? Um, the next slide, Jamie. And these are all gilded silver, gold, solid, 22 karat gold, um, gems, stones. I mean, you know, the cross of Lothair, which is a processional cross, and the imperial crown of the Holy Roman Empire. So these are major things. Um, also, you know, there's other reliquaries there as well. There are 40 boxes from the home of Beethoven from Bonn, and they include the manuscript for the sixth pastoral for the sixth symphony, which is the pastoral symphony. Um, so they can't do anything about this, though. One of the things with the monuments men is that they can never they can never procure. They aren't given transport. They aren't giving they aren't given a crew, so to speak. I'm sure there's a better word for that of soldiers to work with them, of enlisted soldiers. So they're constantly trying to you know, haggle <laughs> equipment and transport and all sorts of things. So he can't do anything about this, but they realize that that is in a really dangerous condition for the paintings and for other things, given the, the conditions, right? That it's so humid, that the, the sulfurous air, the dripping water, you know, paintings are starting to form mold. So they know they have to get them out, but they, they just can't do it then. Um, so <laughs> eventually they're able to, you know, corral some trucks. So they think they've got a group of trucks. So they all go back. Jamie, can I have a slide? And when they arrive, they see this sign, which essentially reads Golden Arrow Art Museum, Europe's art treasures restored. And so the 8th Infantry, which was guarding the mine, had decided to make it into an exhibition, really sort of as a joke, right? Um, and so the Golden Arrow was their, their symbol, their insignia, whatever. So that that stands for the 8th Infantry, but but um, Hancock thought it was really pretty funny. So they get there, they're all ready, but then they find out that the transport had been sent somewhere else. So they come back the second time. And um, the second time on May 25th, they're supposed to get 19 trucks, they get there, and then those trucks have been re-sent re to, to, um, to transport displaced people displaced persons. So then they, so Hancock says, well, so he, he haggles four of them out because he knows the Aachen treasures need to go back. And, and also they're so big, the cases, and there's a huge wooden door that they can't get the other things out. So he gets four trucks, um, gets all of those on, and they go directly to Aachen. And so he takes care of that. But of course, he only had four trucks. So he finally gets it together, he gets all the trucks, he gets them all there, they're gonna be for him. There's 30, there's 23 trucks, they arrive June 1st, he knows it, he only has two days to load, June 1st is a Saturday, um, and he doesn't have anyone to load, they don't send him any crew. So he uses civilians for a while, but they have to stop at five and they won't work on Sunday. So then he's really stuck because he can't keep these trucks because the army's gonna need them for something else. So he's problem, right, problems. <laughs> so, um, one of his one of his assistants um, becomes his name is Ratensky, um, and he becomes really good at just finding people. And and Hancock learns just to not ask how. But so uh, Ratensky gets um, the Segan police force, and so they come out. They help him load on Sunday. Um, <clears throat> so <laughs> and then once they, I should tell you when they were sending off the Aachen treasures to Aachen, he said they didn't realize until they got all out that that area was now controlled by the 15th Army's area. So you would need a pass. And so there's all this problem with the pass because as he says, quote, I knew that even Charlemagne, despite his 1,100 1, 1, years of residence in Aachen would not be gracious, gracious would not be graciously revealed, oh goodness, would not be graciously received by the Americans there without proper clearance. And in fact, it was a problem, but they finally got it through. So he's got these 23 trucks they get the police force to help them load. There's no electric power. There's no ventilation system. So they get them all back. They get them loaded. And let me just tell you what they loaded in two days. They packed and loaded 44 cases from the Lanz Museum in Bonn, 13 cases of paintings from the Surmont Museum in Aachen, one case from the Klosterkerke at Hoven, one case from the Thyssen House, five cases from the Metz Cathedral Treasure, eight cases from Essen, 21 cases from Cologne, six cases from Sieberg, Siegberg, uh, 517 unpacked paintings from Aachen, Essen, Munster, Cologne, and Wuppertal, 56 pieces of sculpture from Aachen, Cologne, and Essen, eight stained glass panels, two choir books, one filing cabinet, 
one cabinet from Zizentik, two frames, two suitcases, and nine miscellaneous boxes and parcels. <laughs> so they all get them to Marburg on June 4th. And then what is he faced with? He has no one to unload them. So Ratensky, or not Ratensky, um, uh, Ratensky searches. He makes an agreement with, um, uh, with the jailer. And so they use city jail inmates, but they can't use them for long. Finally, six men return from military prison. And so they're able to help out. At this point, George Stout, remember I told you, is the chief of conservation. He starts taking over things, doing short-term conservation. They go to Marburg because Hancock, Hancock was forming a collecting center. It was his idea to create these collecting centers where all these objects could go, be indexed, and shipped back out after the war. And in fact, in fact, the uh, military services use exactly that. There's a handful of, of um, dis, you know, shipping places um, around the country or around, around Europe. So his um, area in Marburg handles objects that had been stored in places in the Rhineland, in Westphalia, and in Hessen. Very few of these were looted. I know the big story is that they were looted. Um, and ones in um, ones further south, like in Bavaria and ones in Austria, did have enormous caches of Nazi looted objects. The ones really from that were going to Marburg were German, Belgian owned, you know, they were their, their own objects. So by the end of the war, the monuments men really pivoted from doing what Hancock had been doing to recovery, um, to returning things rather than recovery and preservation. And by this time, monuments men are full of trained curators and art historians. And so really, I think um, Hancock thought it was ready for him to go home. He is released from his duties on March 5th in 1946 and he returns to his position at the Pennsylvania Academy of Fine Arts. One year later, he's promoted to major. Um, and if you are wondering, you know, the Monuments Men movie, Hancock, uh, the character of Sergeant Walter Garfield is loosely based on Hancock and it is played by John Goodman, who is also a fellow St. Louisan. So, um, so after this, he goes back to sculpting and I wanna look at just one post-war sculpture and Jamie, can we do another slide? And that is, he was he uh, he received a commission um, from the Pennsylvania Railroad to do a sculpture in their 30th Street 30th Street station in Philadelphia in 1949. It was meant to commemorate. The president comes to him, talks to him what he wants. It was meant to commemorate the 1,307 railroad employees who had died in World War II. So the first problem, which is what I show you here was the setting. It's a large cavernous space. It is 95 feet by 2,090 feet um, with fluted columns, uh, 95 feet tall, excuse me, and then 2,090 feet um, long. So this huge, these um, fluted columns on the end, these tall windows. Um, and so that's a problem. The second problem is that the president wanted, and I quote Hancock, a lady angel lifting up a dead soldier, suggesting he suggested that the soldier's shirt should be torn and grenades on his belt to be more realistic, which Hancock did not want to do, but he's negotiating, right? He's being very um, diplomatic. Again, problems. So he comes up with sort of strategic di diplomacy. And can I have another slide? Uh, so he creates the Archangel Michael, and he's raising the body of a dead soldier to heaven. It is a towering uh, bronze sculpture. Uh, it's got, it goes up 40 feet tall. Um, the figure itself is 29 feet. He wanted the figure to be human scaled, but so we put him on a raised, um, a raised um, a pedestal to keep it at a human scale, but to soar. And I love the way the columns, you know, he, he makes the, he's thinking of the space. He makes those wings go right into the columns and it's just beautiful. It gives it sort of a an undulating line next to the straight line of the column. And it, it's just, I think it's just really so perfect in alignment with space, um, but it's 29, 40 feet tall. It weighs 10, 10 and a half tons. So it is a massive sculpture. Um, now I wanna talk about his method too again. So next slide, Jamie. So again, he presented a sketch version, um, very rough. I don't have, an, I don't have the, the object for that. Um, and then he, it's approved to proceed with a study model about three feet high, which he works out, you know, all of the different things to it. 
Um, and it's from the study model that they establish sort of the main proportions, the, you know, they figure out the costs that it would be based on that. Then he makes a one third scale model. And that's what you see on the left here that's at the Cape Ann Museum. And he makes it in clay. Um, so it's 12 feet tall and it involves sort of all the final solutions to all the different details. But then what he does, because, you know, this is a big space is that he makes a, a photographic blow up, <laughs> literally the same size of that. And I, you know, in the forties, I mean, that must be a crazy thing to do. Um, and they lift it up on a scaffolding at the station where the sculpture is going to be so he can see it in size. And, and he does change some things. For instance, he says, well, the hair of, um, of Michael, of the arch archangel Michael, he said, matched too much the fluting on the top of the columns. So he changed that some, he changed, you know, this and that to get the proportions right, because it does change, you know, when you go from something small to something large. So he gets all of that worked out. And then um, <clears throat> from the scale model, he has a carver, remember how I told you, uses a pentagraph or, um, and makes the larger piece and and the carvers for this made it into three pieces and that middle photograph is you see Hancock working on um, one of the three sections and what he does after you've got the after you've got the um, you know the full scale remember this is going to be cast in bronze is he goes back in and and hand does all of the details I mean it takes him months actually almost a year to do all of them you know making it more precise and and he also always works with a live model and I show you doing that with he had a commission for a post office pediment and so you see how he's got the live model right next to the full scale model so he can kind of you know get a sense of life from the actual body. Um, so then it's finished in three sections. There is a plaster cast made, so a plaster cast is made over all of this, and the cast is shipped to the Roman bronze work, which is one of the top um, foundries in the United States at the time for bronze casting. Uh, the Roman bronze works cast it in 16 sections that then is brought back and, and put together then in the, um, in the stadium or in the station. So my question is, does it work? So can we take the next slide? And I just show you some details of it. And I think um, you know, granted, this is an interior sculpture, and he talks about the the you know the problem of, of creating some sort of a of an intimacy and a and a memorial space right on the interior, which is at the soldiers memorial. It's on the outside, and it's more sort of heraldic and and setting up a kind of a um, a memorial tone right as you walk into that building, and it matches the lines and the the sort of big lines, simple forms, massive forms of the building. So this is a very different thing. It's much more detailed. It's in bronze. So the lights hit it and are going to fall on all of those different, you know, muscles in the shoulders. You see, it's a much more fluid effect in, in bronze. He's thinking of that uh, than it is in limestone. Um, but also, I think that there is, you know, there's a result of him being in the war, I think, and seeing what he did and the people who, um, he became close to and that whole being in that whole theater, I think has changed him and how he thinks about um, about memorials, but it's a different space as well right. But you know the there's some you can tell he used a live model because there's these moments where where the sculpture sort of becomes flesh and where I see that is where uh, Michael's hands are holding up um, the dead the dead body, the soldier's dead body and the laying of the head. And even if you look at the bronze detail on the left, you see how the legs are a little slack, right? As they sort of fall down and it has no weight. Um, so he really, it's not just a symbol, right? It's a real body. And I think in some sense that comes from him, but it is also him knowing sculpture and knowing what it means to memorialize someone to, for someone walking through the, through the um, station who very well in the 50s and 40s lost someone and lost you know a real person to them in the war and so it's a it's a melding of that thing I think what he draws from maybe not exactly but I think you'll see my point and Jamie can I have the last slide is Michelangelo's Pieta Pieta and, and I say that, I remember going to see this for the first time I was in high school and I could not stop looking at it because I just couldn't figure out how it was so beautiful. You know, you'd look at parts, but it like, it, it came together as a whole. And one of the things I remember just staring at was the way that Mary's hand comes underneath um, 
the Christ's um, shoulder holding him up, right? And the way he sort of falls in that hand, you know, the, the fold of that skin, you know, uh, from the armpit up just was so real and, and so much like someone struggling to, to hold onto something. And I see that in the arms and the way the um, skin folds around, you know, um, Michael pulling up that, that um, soldier, right? Bring, you know, to for ascension into heaven. And it's all sort of given this upward movement, right? It's so physical and that um, figure is falling down. And in Mary, in the Michelangelo, you know, it all kind of folds down on itself, right? But here, those wings, you know, your eye goes up into the ceiling, right? And with 95 foot ceilings, you can do that in this space. So he's actually sort of using what might be difficult in this space as, you know, as a, as a strength for it. Um, so, so I'm, I'm going to end with that, um, just with sort of seeing his life, you know, between what the word does it for him as a soldier, um, but also as a sculptor. <clears throat> um, and he made many, many of these, of these memorials, right? So he was as decorated, to just end my talk, he was as decorated as a sculptor as he was as an officer. He won many um, military awards, he was decorated. He also um, was awarded the National Medal of the Arts, which is for his work as a sculpture. And he was also awarded the Presidential Medal of Freedom in 1990 and that Medal of Arts was in 1989. Um, Hancock passed away on December 30th of 1998. Um, and you can see many of his works, you know, the Zuni, um, the Zuni bird charmer, but also if you've ever been to the National Cathedral in Washington, DC, and you walk up to the high altar, there is um, a Madonna that's, uh, uh, you know, Christ, Christ God in, what's it called? I can't even think of the name, but that's one of his carvings. There's also um, an Abraham Lincoln that's in one of the side sections of that cathedral that's amazing, and that's also by him. So that's my talk. I guess I should open this up to see if there are any questions. Yeah, thank you, Melissa. You're welcome. Um, as a reminder to the audience, we, we got some people joining kind of partway through. Uh, so if you have questions, please just use the Q&A box um, there on your Zoom toolbar. That's going to be the easiest place for us to find your questions. Um, while we wait for audience questions to roll in, I, I suppose it's more of a comment than a question. But um, something that's really interesting to me about the Monuments Men is there's almost a disconnect in my mind between the way that it, the, the economies of these countries completely reorganized around the war effort and, and just a huge percentage of Americans were in uniform for World War II. I can't remember the exact percentage, but just so many people. And, and that always suggests to me, like, this is all, like, everything has to be for the war effort. Um, that's the only thing that matters. We, we kind of can't afford to be doing anything else right now. Everybody's... Um, uh, rationing and everything like that. And um, so the fact, I mean, not that it was hugely prioritized, like you said, he, he didn't really have uh, personnel that he was working with or anything like that, but that, that this was on anybody's mind is kind of um, amazing to me. Um, and it, it reminds me as well of uh, the, the recent loss um, in Palmyra, Palmyra uh, from ISIS. You know, we, we were seeing tragic human suffering coming out of that uh coming out of that um but we also care when uh when we have cultural losses like that and and that's that's really interesting to me i guess uh, the <laughs> maybe it feels more natural to you in, in the line of work that you're in but uh, but to me it's not intuitive that um that the emotional impact of cultural loss would, would be that heavy mm. well i think it is because i think that's the power of objects right or is the power of creative inquiry of any kind, whether it be music or, or maybe visual art often <clears throat> seems more tangible in this way in that it, you know, if you've grown up in Aachen, let's say, <clears throat> and you, you know, went to the Aachen Cathedral and part of who you were is that this was Charlemagne's throne, right? The throne is there and it's his court and his bones are there. And, and you know, there's, there's a sense of who you are because of experiencing those things, partially because of the beauty, partially because of, you know, seeking solace sometimes in those things or the, the association of them. <clears throat> and so, yes, you know, I mean, of course, you know, as you noticed, he's, he was always taking second place to displ dis displaced persons. And, and that's exactly right. But, you know, the objects 
you know, they tell us who we are and where we've come from. And they speak to us when we need, when we need something, right? When we need something, um, something to speak to our, to, to our inner world. And so I do think that's why, for instance, you know, when he, when he goes into Leglez, they don't, you know, there's maybe a dozen citizens or, you know, population who are there and they are, you know, they don't want it to leave. They're, they're, it's part of them. They had just put, they had discovered it a couple of years before and had just put it into the church. And it was a very, um, you know, proud thing for that community, right. you know? And so there are things that when you're in a situation like that, there are things that become even closer to you. They define you, they define the resistance to whatever's going on, mm -hmm. or they, they tell you that you're going to, get through this, right? If they are, you are. And so it's a really, it's a powerful thing that objects have. And that, like I said, creative inquiry has the fact that, you know, these people were carrying crates of, of the manuscript of Beethoven's Sixth Symphony, you know, that the pastor, you know, that listening to it or knowing that this is what it was, how it was made. And, you know, it's a, um, it's a moment where you go outside of who you are or inside to who you are, right? It's a moment of either becoming bigger, I, I right. guess you could say. So yes, it does take a second, but I would say that Eisenhower, um, it, I mean, all the way from the president down, were a hundred percent behind this. Mm -hmm. yeah. We actually do have a few audience questions by now. Um, the first one is, uh, St. Louis Art Museum had an exhibit some years ago with Walker Hancock's work. Um, do you know where uh, that's being held? You mean his work? His mm -hmm. work is, gosh, you know, all over. Uh, there's quite a bit in Boston. Um, there is, I mean, it's in major museums everywhere. The, the um, half scale uh, model that I told you about is in the Boston Museum of Fine Arts. I don't know that it's up right now, but it often is. Um, as I told you, there's National Cathedral. Um, medals are held different places. The um, St. Louis, the museum does have more, more works by Hancock than just the, um, the model, the, the clay model. Uh, so, you know, you, you would just look up, <laughs> you know, around where you are. And actually that's one of the nice things about the internet is that you can, I mean, he's a, he was considered the Dean of American realist sculpture, sort of modern realism. So, you know, Pennsylvania Academy of Fine Arts has many works by him. So it's just a matter of typing him in and a city where you want to go and just sure. there truly. You so know, so you there were a lot of loans for that exhibit, it sounds like. Yeah, yes, I'm sorry, yes, many, there were. Um, another question. Uh, when I was in Normandy at the time of the 75th anniversary of the invasion, one of the elderly veterans there uh, told me that after the war ended, he and many of his fellow soldiers spent many months essentially as librarians inventorying works of art stolen by the Nazi regime. Uh, do you know if Walker Hancock would have been involved in any way with that post-war effort? So he, you know, really by the post-war is when they brought in lots of curators and art historians. And <clears throat> so, and he really, you know, he sort of felt like his, that early stage when there were just 10 of them working, that that was sort of done, that process was done, and that the inventorying and then sending things back out was really another group. And so that was a much larger group that did that process. He did inventory, his center in Marburg, you know, he's the one who had that concept and it really, you know, it worked throughout Europe, did inventory all of the things that came through and then, you know, I mean, when he went back home, there were still people there to send, you know, to send things back, to return things. And as I said, he didn't really deal with many looted objects. Um, that really was more like Neuschwanstein um, in, in Austria and in sort of Southern Germany and Bavaria is where most of the, the Nazis. Um, did okay. Uh, who was behind the preservation of the artifacts? Was this an effort from the Americans or were they asked by uh, European peoples? It was a British and American endeavor. This, this whole process was, was um, supported by the British and the American um, armies. Mm -hmm. um, it's amazing that so many works were found and secured without damage. How much work needed repair um, that were found and rescued? And is, is any of that still, is any of that work still happening? Um, I don't know if it's still happening. It might be. I mean, I think that depends on resources, right? <clears throat> and priority. That's true of museums still today. Um, 
I mean, many were damaged, mainly from the conditions or being taken out of their frames, um, you know, by people who don't know how to take paintings out of the frames or, you know, damaged in transport, sculpture, that often happens. Um, I think you'd be surprised at how many things were preserved and weren't damaged. Um, that's why also, <clears throat> you know, I mentioned that George Stout was a conservator and went along with him and so was um, Keck. I can't think of his first name as well. Conservators were there and they were treating objects, you know, the objects that came out of Tegan were damaged. The paintings, particularly, the, the, the paint was starting to lift because of the humidity, it had mold on them. And in fact, um, Stout and Keck went right away and started repairing some of them. The Ghent altarpiece had paint that was lifting and, and some issues with its um, panel because it's painted on panel. So there were issues, but you know, like I told you, Chartres Cathedral, or not Chartres, I'm sorry, um, the Cologne Cathedral, which is just massive and also has these huge um, spires and, and uh, stained glass windows, they took all the windows out and stored them and then put them all back in. So like the, even the, the citizens of those areas were so concerned about these things that they would do that is pretty remarkable. Mm. And uh, you, you and I know, working for museums, that uh, the, the people in charge of the collections are so particular about temperature and humidity and light exposure that the idea of these things sitting in a dank mine is just like impossible for me to wrap my mind around. Yes. And, and, and the fact that um, it sounds like the damage wasn't as extensive as, as, I, as I might have guessed pretty yeah. amazing as well yeah i mean there were things damaged but not the way you would think yeah um is, is there any thought that there might have uh, or how much art is it thought kind of went missing and, and wasn't recovered oh gosh you know i should have looked up the number so i apologize um I, that's that was a very obvious question for this and it, it was hundreds of thousands wow um i you know i'll I'll look that up and I'll pass it on to Jamie and then maybe he can share it or you can do an email, give you your email or something and I'll, I'll share it with you. But it was hundreds of thousands. Wow. Yeah. Um, let's see, we are running out of time and we've, we have quite a few questions. We'll get through as many as we can. Um, where could someone find a list of monuments men and their efforts in rescuing works of art? Oh, actually, that's great. There is a website, the Monuments Men Foundation. One of the most moving ceremonies I think I've gone to in a long time was in Washington, D.C. when um, the Monuments Men were given the um, Presidential Medal. Um, and there were three of them there. There's only mm. four living still, and three of them were there. So yeah, that foundation, and that'll get you all over from there. Um, let's see, you can see works by Walker Hancock in the Cape Ann Museum, including a wonderful collection of sculptural sketches of basketball players. Just a nice little comment. Uh, where are the sculptures that were in the SLAM Sculpture Hall now kept? Are they ever brought back on display? Well, some of them we still have. Most of those were from the World's Fair and they were casts. I mean, obviously they were casts. And, you know, for a long time in the early 20th century or mid-century, <clears throat> people stopped using casts and stopped thinking of them as real art. And so they were destroyed, most of them. Many, most of them went to, um, uh, went to Washington University. But I mean, it's just something that all museums did, unfortunately. We have a couple, uh, a couple comments from someone. It sounds like the, this is maybe uh, a descendant of Walker Hancock. Uh, oh. Remarkable job of capturing my father's work. Thank you so much. Oh. Some details. Uh, his right hand man was Steve Kavalyek. Thank you. Um, National Cathedral, Christ and Majesty, Monuments Men movie altered the story. For example, they were never all together in a truck, they were alone or in pairs. And the largest collection of Walker Hancock's works is at Cape Ann Museum in Gloucester, Massachusetts. Well, thank, thank you. Thank you. And Dini, thank you so much for, for, for tuning in. <laughs> it's that Dini is Walter Hancock's daughter. Okay, then uh, I'm seeing a different name here, but oh well. Um, we have a question, where can I find a recording of this? Uh, so after a few days, uh, the videos for all of these online programs that MHS is offering are up on our YouTube page. If you just YouTube uh, search uh, Missouri Historical Society, it should be pretty easy to find. It'll be under the um, St. Louis History Live playlist. Okay, I think we managed. <laughs> I think we managed to answer almost all the questions. Um, 
just to, to wrap up, thanks again for tuning in. Thank you, Melissa, for, uh, for speaking. This was a really cool topic. Uh, and uh, thanks to our members. Um, if you'd like to sign up uh, for our newsletter or uh, become a member of the Missouri Historical Society, you can do that at mohistory.org support. We're putting on uh, a couple of these programs every single week these days. Uh, so just tomorrow at 6.30 p.m., uh, there will be a panel on uh, LGBT activism in the St. Louis area. And then Tuesday, April 20th at 11 a.m., um, the uh, there will be a talk on uh, women's history, uh, sorry, some notable women in the history of the Hill uh, neighborhood. Um, Oh, and yes, I, I remembered. Uh, when the uh, when the webinar closes out, it should automatically open a survey in your browser. If you'd be willing to just take a couple of minutes to fill that out, uh, that's really helpful for us in improving our programming. So, um, unless you have anything else, Melissa, uh, thanks everyone for tuning in, and uh, we'll see you in the next one. Thank Bye. you so much.